Oh, I have to sit here and listen to me speak. And I thought, well, maybe we could do both. And um, uh, as I studied on Thursday and Friday uh, in regards to um, my preparation for this morning, as usually happens, I had more material than I, than I needed to cover in, in one lesson. So I, I, I pulled a, a switch. Uh, Robert had said he was looking forward to uh, this evening's message, and, and you're absolutely right in regards to uh, when we think about God being judged, a lot of times we are a harsher judge on ourselves than God is, and so we'll deal with that next week. But, but I, I thought of some strategies, uh, because dealing with delayed gratification is... Um, is something that all of us as Christians, especially if we've been raised in the American culture, should have dealt with because we were raised to take care of our needs now and take care of me and take care of me and what I want. And, and, and a lot of the struggles that we have in society really are that. So um, as I worked through the things that I struggled with, I also saw other people who struggled with their own things, but it's the same uh, the same issue, and that's dealing with self-control. And so as we talk about that tonight, I've interspersed some songs that, that teach us the different ways to, to focus on how to build self-control uh, in our lives. Uh, Daniel is going to be leading our songs, Daniel Fitzsimmons, and his first two songs are going to focus on the fact that all we need is God. That's all we need in our lives. Uh, but there's, of course, of course, is more to that. And as we look at the different points of the strategy, uh, we will sing a song that goes with each of those points. As a new Christian, I, I wanted to be a faithful Christian, and I, I wanted to do what was right. But me, perhaps like some of you, had things in my life that... Uh, that I needed to overcome. I had habits that I developed. And I had to know that I could be faithful in my walk and fulfill my commitments. Galatians chapter 6, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, lists some of the things that are common to our struggles. Where Paul reminds us of the the works of the flesh, he says, uh, they are obvious. Sexual immorality, moral impurity, promiscuity, idolatry, sorcery, hatreds, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and anything similar. That's a basic list, and I, I, would, I would think that that one of these, or maybe more of these, touches or has touched each of our lives in, in the course of our trying to follow Christ. And, and, and all of these uh, come under the umbrella as we're trying to deal with them of, of self-control. The, the passage that's really our key for this evening is Second Timothy chapter 1. And I remember hearing this when, when, I was, when I was very young in the faith. And it, it gave me hope because it helped me to, um, to grasp on to some truth that, that I just I hadn't known and hadn't heard about. Paul says to the young man Timothy, I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience as, conscience as my ancestors did. When I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, remembering your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy, clearly recalling your sincere faith that first lived in your grandmother Lois and then in your mother Eunice and that I am convinced is also in you. Therefore, I remind you to keep ablaze the gift of God that is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fearfulness, but one of power, 
love, and of sound judgment. There are several items here that that need to be in place if we're going to be faithful Christians. One, Paul talks about the relationship that he had with Timothy. And, and young Christians always need older Christians to, uh, to mentor them, uh, to give them an example to follow. Uh, older Christians need this younger Christian as, as someone that they can teach and lead and, and help mentor and help them and, and give back because of what has been given to them. We should be in one of these two places. We should either be young Christians, and that, that's, I guess that's a frame of mind, but young Christians uh, looking for someone to be a mentor, or an older Christian who has, has gained a degree of faithfulness uh, that we can share with others. Paul also mentions here the importance of, of the faith that existed in the mother and the grandmother. And so those generational expressions of faith are very important. But that didn't ensure that Timothy would be the man that he became. He needed to grasp and take hold of himself the things that he was taught. And that's why in verse 6 it says, Therefore I remind you to keep ablaze. You see that? To keep ablaze, not just get by. Not just, um, you know, do your best. Because in reality, when we're connected with God, what happens in our lives is more than just our best. It's God's best. And he uses that terminology to keep ablaze. And that's what I wanted for my life. I didn't want to just get by. I didn't want to live the Christian life that I've heard others talk about where uh, there's this mediocrity and this complacency and this hypocrisy. I didn't want that. I wanted these words to define my faith, to keep ablaze the gift of God that is in you through the laying on of my hands. And then he reminds him the nature of that gift and the power of the Spirit and the workings of the Spirit in his life. And that those are our power. We're not weak. We're, we're strong. We're powerful. Love, uh, just love transforms everything when that dynamic is, is pushing our lives and sound judgment. In some translations, it says self-control. But it's, it's the ability to, to look forward and delay gratification and make decisions about what I do with my life based on what's best for my life. And so with that hope, I began to to lean on God and this truth and, and overcome my particular difficulty. And, um, and, and one of the things that helped me perhaps the most was to give myself permission to fail. The idea of instant gratification uh, doesn't just have to do with uh, getting my, uh, you know, my pleasure fix. It also has to do with how other people look at me. And, and, and even what you said, Robert, about how we are too hard on ourselves. We want instant gratification in, in our faith. I want it all now. But it's not all going to happen now. It's a growth process. And I need to give myself permission to fail. We need, we need to give ourselves permission to fail. And, and so not only, now this may sound weird to you, but if, if you've struggled through um, a temptation and a sin that caused you to stumble often and you're, you're dealing with that, and, and the thing that I mentioned this morning was when I was young, and, and I brought this from my pre-Christian days, I had a, a problem with pornography. And it's a problem that still uh, plagues, and it's even gotten worse, and it's, 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 it's infected the lives and the minds of our children because of the access of it, and it's distorted their idea of, of, of sexuality. And, and, and so um, sometimes, if I felt that temptation, 
I told myself, wait, maybe you can enjoy, and I use the words enjoy, maybe you can do this later, but not now, put it off, put it off. And when I talked myself into putting it off, you know what I did? I practiced discipline. I practiced the power that is in God. I can put this off. And and that principle helped me overcome a lot of things that I learned in my pre-Christian days. And I've talked with other young men and women who've done the same thing. They have uh, had this struggle, the things in this list in Galatians chapter 5, had those struggles and, and they knew it. And they asked for forgiveness, but also God says there's, there's, there's self-control too. So practice self-control, practice delayed gratification and, and put off that short-term pleasure. And, and before I knew it, it wasn't something that characterized my life anymore. Self-control is, is not only something that Christians stress and Christianity stresses, but many successful people in our world realize the value of it. I was reading about the Wizard of Westwood. Do we know who the Wizard of Westwood was? He was John Wooden, the coach at UCLA, and for a 12-year period as head coach of the basketball team at UCLA, he won 10 NCAA national championships and a record seven in a row, and he holds, his teams hold that record of, of those number of wins and also the number of uh, consecutive wins, 88 games in the NCAA Men's Basketball Association. He was named Coach of the Year six times. And what made him, so what made him a great coach? What made him uh, someone who was an influencer of others? And, and he says that it was his faith. He says, I've always tried to make it clear that basketball is not the ultimate. It is of small importance in comparison to the total life we live. There is only one kind of life that truly wins, and that is the one that places faith in the hands of the Savior. He was the, the one who coined the phrase, and you may have heard this before. He said, I hoped my, my faith was apparent to others. If I were ever prosecuted for my religion, I truly hoped that there would be enough evidence to convict me. You've heard that phrase before. He stressed self-control in his own life and in the life of his athletes. And he said, this idea uh, reaches even into your parenting. He says, um, even if it is, and, and he, he talked, so in his mind, discipline and self-control went together. Uh, discipline means I'm going to work hard and put off some stuff so that I can have rewards later. He said, even if it is disciplining your children and our children cry out for and need discipline, and this was a long time ago when he said this, some things never change. He says, it must be done with reason to be effective. So he's talking about using, using self-control in parenting. He says, you cannot antagonize and be a positive influence. And what he means by that is, when we are harsh and are angry and lose control in parenting our children, we're not influencing them, we're antagonizing them. So that's, a, that's an interesting uh, insight. He said, remember that discipline is not to punish, but it is to correct, to improve, and to prevent. To help so that we must maintain our self-control at all times if we are going to function anywhere near our own particular level of competence. Whatever that might be, self-control is self-discipline. He went so far as he did not allow his students to, to use profanity. He said, profanity indicated a lack of self-control. And if you didn't have control over your body and what you did, you would never have control over your mind, and thus you would not have control over what you said. 
And so the idea of self-control is not only important in in our Christian faith, but really in every walk of life. And it's encouraging to know that that Christians have used their place in our society to be influencers and, and to teach that. And, and unfortunately, it's not something that is, that is stressed a lot uh, in our self-indulgent world. As we move forward this evening, I want to, I want to make... Uh, I want to bring out five points, five strategies that will help us to build self-control. And the first one is found in Matthew chapter 5. And so what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll look at the passage, make a comment, and then I'm going to ask Daniel to come up and lead the song. Daniel, you pointed out that one of the song numbers was incorrect, if you'll notate that when we come to it. Thank you. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 19 gives us the basic value of a child of God. It says, Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches people to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands, so it's, it's, it's not enough to know them and then practice them, teach them, teach these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Of heaven, and, and so that gives our our basic value in life, um, in in the world of of uh, success and inspiration and motivation. Uh, they use the same idea of of know your values, but for them it it's complete. It's, it might be something different, but for us, our our primary value, the thing that is most central to us, is to practice. And teach the word of God. The next strategy to to build self-control is know what you want to accomplish. Uh, For me, I I, I knew what I wanted to accomplish. I wanted to, to overcome temptation and sin. And so I put that before me. Paul describes it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And, and really, he begins the idea in verse 24. He says, Don't you know that the runners in a stadium all race, but only one receives a prize? Run in such a way to win the prize. See, there's, there's an objective set out before the runner. He's trying to win the prize. He, he has that objective. He's, the runner is, is not trying to uh, uh, just finish the race, uh, not trying necessarily to get the best time, but trying to receive the prize. And he says, run in such a way to win the prize. Now, everyone who competes exercises self-control in everything. However, they do it to receive a crown that will fade away. But we, a crown that will never fade. Therefore, I do, not, I do not run like one who runs aimlessly or box like one beating the air. Instead, I discipline my body and bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Paul not only tells us how we can overcome difficulties and challenges in our personal life, he's He's really explaining to us how to find fulfillment as, as a person. And that is focus on, on your goal and then use all of your strength and all of your discipline to achieve that goal. The next strategy is creating a plan. In James chapter 4, James gives us some insight in what that plan should include. Oftentimes, humans make plans based on what we think. And and what, what we want to accomplish... And sometimes even what we feel what God wants us to accomplish. 
But it is possible for us to move forward with, with something that doesn't take into account what James says. Verse 13. Come now you who say today or tomorrow we will travel to such and such a city and spend a year there and do business and make a profit. You don't even know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. For you are like smoke that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you should say, if the Lord wills, we will do this or that. And uh, I just want to stop there and say, he's not giving us some sort of a magical saying there. As, as long as you say, if the Lord wills, then, then everything's fine. But what he's saying there is, is that I have a, a mindset that, that what I do with my life, which is a gift from God and which is directed by God, it has to reflect these values of God. It has to reflect the uh, the priorities that God has uh, for uh, for us and, and for His His world. Um, he He just reminds us in sort of a negative way in the end. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. So it is a sin for the person who doesn't know to do what is good. So it is a sin for the person who knows to do what is good and doesn't do it. I think that statement is carrying on the idea that sometimes we just do things because we want to do them. We may know the right thing to do, but we choose to do it just because we want to. And when we are the ones making the plans, um, we are warned in Scripture that those plans will fail. But if we make those plans, uh, knowing that God is is our our inspiration, our ideas, and even in some cases our action, um, then those plans can succeed. The fourth strategy is to prioritize, and there are a lot of things that serve as as priorities in the lives of people. Sometimes it's money, sometimes uh, time, sometimes the future. And, and God is the only one that is uh, the worthy priority. And, and Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 3 what, what his priority is. Beginning in verse 10. He says, my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Things like this teaching have to be compared to the things that we held as priorities before coming to a place when we're uh, very committed to the Lord. Um, other things were our pr- priorities. It may be money, maybe time, maybe, uh, uh, maybe some things for our future, uh, maybe something even less noble. But, uh, but, but Paul, uh, someone who had some things as his priority, some things that he thought was most important to do and accomplish with his life. And, and we read about his past and we read about his, his violence and his anger and, and his, his misplaced zeal. And, and probably at times that was overwhelming to him. Probably at times it, it caused him to feel extremely sad inside because of his, his prior priorities. And, and, and so he, he starts out talking about, you know, something that perhaps is noble, and, and it definitely is, to, to know the power of the resurrection, 
But he goes on and talks about the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And you can see in these words the agony and the depth of, of his passion uh, because of what he did and now what he wants to do. And so his, his priority has nothing to do with, with his life and what he might accomplish. His priority is to be totally identified with the death of Christ. The final strategy is to reward yourself. And in the, in the world of success motivators, this may mean something completely different than what it means to us here this evening. Um, you know, that might mean to, um, to do something nice for yourself. So it might be some sort of a physical indulgence. And, and, and that still might, that still might hold for us as followers of Christ. If, if I've been, uh, if I'm trying to get in shape and, and I've allowed and I've maintained my, my calorie count and, and achieved some goals there, uh, through self-control and through discipline. And uh, I get to enjoy, uh, say, a piece of cake like we had at the Newcomers Fellowship this evening or this, this afternoon. Um, perhaps it's there. But, but Scripture gives us a different focus. And, and the, the passage in Psalm 37 speaks to the, uh, to the reward of the believer in in this life. Psalm 37, verse 4, says, Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Um, When you read that phrase, take delight in the Lord, now what does that that mean to you? What, What does that conjure up in your mind in regards to uh, the point that the psalmist is trying to make. Um, I, I read that and I, I say somehow, uh, enjoy the Lord, um, uh, revel in Him, um, uh, be pleased uh, by Him. You know, it, it, may, it may have something to do with how you express yourself. It, 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 may, uh, it may simply deal with your, your commitment to Him. Um, but but that is that is the reward uh, in this life is being able to to light, delight in the Lord and to enjoy Him and and when we do that He will give you the desires of your heart and and the the next verse there uh, through verse six commit your way to the Lord trust in Him and He will act make your righteousness shine like the dawn your justice like the noonday. And so he brings that all together for us. That if our, if our plan, our, our strategy is to practice and teach God's command, uh, then he will bring that together for us. And we, uh, as we move through these strategies, uh, that's his reward that, that we will succeed in life when we follow his plan. As I hopefully mature in my faith there are things that i'm i've seen god help me overcome but it seems like there's always something else that jumps up and takes its place and and when we focus on self control we are we are claiming a strategy to to make it stop um, and I love this idea of of stopping dominoes. Sometimes that's the way life is. One decision leads to another, leads to another, and leads to another. And 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 God wants that for us. He wants us to just stop, just stop uh, feeling like we don't have control over uh, our lives, that we're at the mercy of fate or the mercy of our decisions or the mercy or uh, the the uh, the 
the failures of our past, that, that those things are what uh, control us, and, and they don't. Uh, when we read Scripture and, and we find these principles, we put them into practice, we're, we're practicing the things that, that God has taught us that will help us to, to not live lives that are focused on instant gratification, but delayed gratification, and ultimately looking forward to that, that eternal home. Um, having a vision of what it may look like. And so what we're talking about this evening is, is living for Jesus. Living for Jesus with faithfulness and integrity and a commitment. And, and that is our goal. And as we sing this song, Living for Jesus, uh, may you, you respond by looking at ways to put the principles of self-control into practice.